in formalities, I content myself merely to stating that it's a privilege for me to stay connected with the learning youth of India. Now the subject given to me, as has already been announced, literature, society and social change. Now we are dealing with sub this subject at a time when on the one hand, there is an incredible pace at which changes are happening. And on the other hand, there is also widespread cynicism about bringing about or effecting beneficial changes. Most people assume that the task of bringing about changes belongs to some very special category of people and that we can only endure the effects of what other people do. The very purpose of this lecture is to interrogate that assumption and to try and convince, if possible, every one of us. Not only that it is possible to bring about beneficial changes, but also that it's our duty to do so particularly at the present time. The alternative to doing that is to assume oneself to be mere victims of circumstances. And uh, that's a psychology or a mindset within which we fail to do justice at once to ourselves and to the society to which we belong. Um, I'm reminded of a character like Lucky in uh, Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot, who feels that he is caught in, a, in the net. He is in the net. He feels hemmed in from all sides, unable to act. And that also is the predicament of the three trams. And uh, perhaps the dramatist wants us to realize that we have allowed ourselves to become tramps who are all dressed up but have nowhere to go. Now, this is a sad predicament to which we don't have to stay consigned and frozen. So in this lecture, I propose to urge upon all of us two things. First of all, we need to believe in our capacity to effect or bring about changes. Number two, we need to know how to go about doing it. It can be done. There is a way to do it. So that's really the simple architecture of this lecture. And we look at both, not as um, people in the general category, but as students or lovers of literature. So I'll locate are thinking as specific to the context of learning, enjoying, celebrating literature, in particular uh, English literature. So let's begin by asking a question as to why literature has this particular genius to awaken the urge to bring about beneficial changes or in one word transformation. I hope you are familiar with the word transformation as against deformation. Transformation is change for the better, deformation change for the worse. As I said at the outset, people readily believe that it is possible to bring about changes for the worse, but it is not possible to bring about changes for the better. In fact, we need to reverse this assumption, we need to question this assumption and propagate a different uh, outlook altogether. Now, um, the attempt to see literature as a resource for bringing about social changes uh, has been gaining academic grounds in recent times, particularly in the last quarter century. I will not bother you and bore you with all the details thereof, but I do have a serious disagreement with that approach. 
and I'll also try to flag my disagreement as we proceed. Let me give you a couple of instances. I hope you're familiar with William Butler Yeats's very celebrated poem, Leda and the Swan. Uh, the theme of that poem is the rape of uh, Leda by Zeus, who assumes the form of a swan. Now, what happens in most universities where the interface between literature and society particularly in light of the duty to bring about changes is examined, is to take off from a poem like that and then go into a study of rape in the society and then also ask questions, why do, why, why do uh, rapes happen and uh, why are women uh, victims, so on and so forth. Uh, I, I, while I agree that there is some merit to this, my disappointment here is that merely looking at the situation as it is doesn't really motivate people to bring about changes. Uh, too much of diagnosis and too little of action is the ideal combination to breed cynicism, despair and ho hopelessness in us. Now in contrast to this, I'm obviously not undertaking a detailed analysis of the poem. It merits analysis but it's not the time for it. Now think of an, an author like uh, Joseph Korsinovsky Conrad, Joseph Conrad, who says that a woman is a continent of mystery, or rather he uses the image of temple. Uh, a, a, a woman is a temple of mystery to man. And he says um, uh, men are like uh, the wayfarer, a man comes to the uh, gate of a temple, he stops there, he knows that some mysterious rites are, are in progress in that temple, but he does not understand what it is. He stands there transfixed in bewilderment and wonder. Now, that's a completely different approach to the idea of, uh, 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 of women or the female principle, if you like to put it that way. Now. The difference between Aitz's poem and uh, this particular perspective is that when you think of uh, women as Conrad does, then uh, your outlook begins to be far more positive. Now, I don't want to, I don't want to belittle uh, uh, Aitz's uh, poem and this uh, cyclical pattern of history which inspires that poem by which Aitz believes that every 2,000 years constitute a historical cycle wh wherein you find actually the commingling of human with something more than human, therefore leader and the swan, swan being God in the form of a swan, uh, or uh, say in the case of Christianity, the idea of uh, a woman conceiving of the Holy Spirit. So these are patterns that AIDS deals with. Uh, I don't want to belittle that, but I'm saying that if you merely stop at that point, then uh, you tend to sort of accept the given and get along without, want, without feeling motivated to bring about a transformative change. So, most people today stay focused on the science of decay and degradation in, in our society. They, f of course, feel it, it provoked and indignant at the ugliness of the present state of affairs, but that's not enough for us as students, teachers of literature. We need to feel inspired, not merely um, provoked or dissatisfied or indignant at the ugliness that prevails. We must also feel inspired by the inherent beauty of individual and collective life. It is this dimension that I find missing from most of the discussions. Our duty is not merely to arrive at a comprehensive diagnosis, virtually spending all our time detailing the symptoms of social pathology, the various signs and manifestations of it. We also need to ask ourselves how the endangered beauty of life can be preserved as well as celebrated. 
And so therefore my approach is the approach of an activist. And I'm glad that Siraj introduced me also as an activist. I consider that aspect of my, my life to be extremely important. Now in this light, let's consider a few literary examples. Now these are all very, very perfunctory references uh, for want of time. Now T.S. Eliot in his celebrated poem, The Wasteland, gives us a fairly uh, comprehensive, well, at least adequate and accurate idea of what ails contemporary life or modern life. Now let me uh, read, read out um, a, few, uh, a few lines from the wasteland. He says, um, son of man, you cannot say or guess. You know only a heap of broken images. What's our problem? We know only, we know life, we know the world, we know the world of realities only as a heap of broken Im images. So the sense of holism, the sense of wholeness is gone. So son of man, you cannot say or guess for you know only a heap of broken images. Where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief and the dry stone no sound of water. It's a very uh, moving lament on what life and uh, civilization has come to be. Uh, no further comment on it. Now let me read out a, a few lines from William Butler Reitz's poem, The Second Coming, uh, which of course looks at the same thing from a different perspective, a perspective very typical of AIDS. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the earth. The blood dim tide is loosed and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. Look at the word. The ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Again, I'm not pausing to offer any comment whatsoever for want of time. Now let me take you to the third uh, uh, literary reference I have in mind. That is to Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Um, it deals with the experience of a university dropout called Raskolnikov. Uh, now through that, uh, as I choose to read the text, Dostoevsky is actually raising a question, a very important question, a question of eternal and universal significance as to, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> pardon me, as to what is the predicament of the individual in the given society. It's very, very important. Now, uh, the problem with Raskolnikov is that uh, he is completely cut off from every form of social intercourse. He has no social life. Uh, he became a dropout from the university. Then his life is confi confined entirely to the little ugly room that he happens to have. Now, it is in that kind of predicament that he thinks up a theory about, uh, you know, his superiority, etc., which results in the murder of two women. And then uh, he is <clears throat> haggarded by the sense of guilt. I don't want to go into I don't want to go into any of those details. What I want us to consider is that once Ashkolnikov reaches the state of complete, uh, say, alienation or severance from the social wellspring of life, and once he also gets burdened with this unmanning sense of guilt, the question is, how does or how can a person like him cope with this situation? What kind of resource is available? What kind of support is available? What kind or what means of personal redemption, rehabilitation, reformation? <clears throat> now, Dostoevsky pays a lot of attention, a very profound attention to depicting how comprehensive and how competent the <clears throat> system for punishing criminals is in the Russia of his days. So the society actually produces the criminals. 
the society specializes in, in punishing the criminals, but the society has zero contributions to offer in order to enable a person to take a turn for the better. <clears throat> now comes a, pr a profoundest aspect of Dostoevsky's vision. How does the reformation and the spiritual rehabilitation of this criminal take place? It takes place through a prostitute called Sonia. So, in the kind of society in which Raskolnikov lived, maybe the kind of society in which we live, <clears throat> that our old, our traditional, our uh, <clears throat> customary assumptions about many things regarding life need to be re-examined. And maybe in our society too, people like uh, Raskolnikov who are on the brink of the abyss, can and can seek and obtain help only from prostitutes. How do we know? Now, this awareness is very important. And <clears throat> the, the beautiful thing about Dostoevsky is that with one eye, he sees very clearly the degradation and the depravity of the society to which he belongs. But with the other eye, he sees the beauty of the remnant of life beleaguered corrupted, degraded, imperial though it be, he still sees that beleaguered beauty of life, connects the two and affirms his faith in life. Now, I think that's a part of literature. You cannot find it in any, any other uh, domain of act, human activity. I dare say you will not see this power even in the sphere of religion. I dare say this. And I emphasize this in order to encourage all of us to realize that we are in a very privileged situation and therefore the kind of contributions that we can make to the society, the health and wholeness of, wholeness of our society should not be underplayed and we should not dodge the opportunities ava uh, made available to us. <clears throat> now, so I just made a very inadequate passing reference to Dostoevsky's uh, tremendous and heroic effort to affirm the endangered, imperiled beauty of life. Now, that to me is the profoundest thing. Whether you think about life, whether you think about literature, whether you think about religion, think about anything, including nation building, to which I shall come in a short while. Now, no, in order to help us understand this better. Let me draw your attention, or rather bring to your notice, another poem. This time by John Keats. Uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this poem. Odd on a Grecian Urn, published in 1819. And um, let me read out the last stanza from this beautiful, immortal uh, poem, Ode on a Grecian Urn. Uh, I read from, uh, I read the last stanza of the poem. O attic shape, fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maiden wrought, with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou silent form, dost tease us out of thought as doth, et as doth eternity, cold pastoral. When old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain. In midst of all other woe than others, a friend to man to whom thou sayest, and pay attention to these immortal words. Beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. Beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all ye know on the earth and all ye know, need to know. Now, to me, that's something on which we can really latch on. Uh, or rather peg our hopes and our sense of purpose. So, in my view of what literature can contribute to if equipping people like us to be, uh, first of all, believers in the possibility of effecting beneficial social changes, as well as ministering our morale to venture upon the much needed task, we need a focus, and that focus I would rather find 
<coughs> paradoxically, not from, not in a religion, not in a school of philosophy, but in literature. And as a representative of that, I suggest that you give a careful reading to John Keats's ode on <coughs> Grecian urn. <coughs> Pardon me. So, according to him, beauty is the bulwark against corruption. Now, there's a lot of talk about corruption in our times, right? Everybody wants to create a corruption-free society. Nobody likes corruption. But corruption is mounting sky high. <laughs> now, there is something very odd about it. And I don't know why people are not bothered about things like this. Now, my submission to all of you is that we cannot launch and win a battle against corruption. It's very easy to stand on the podium and say, na kaunga na kane dunga, and India will be a zone of zero tolerance for corruption. But how will you do that? Unless and until you kindle, you awaken in the minds of all Indians a sense of the beauty. I don't say sanctity advisedly, a sense of the beauty, because as I shall presently argue, Beauty is the very heart of sanctity. If something is beautiful in the true sense of the term, as against the commercial cosmetic sense of the term, uh, it should not be mistaken. In the true sense of the term, beauty uh, is truth, uh, beauty is also purity, beauty is also sanctity, and beauty is also compassion. To that I shall come presently. <clears throat> so, I believe that the life of the individual and the life of the society will be absolutely safe in all respects if we can commit ourselves to preserving, revering <coughs> and celebrating the beauty of life. That's where the that unique and significant contribution of literature comes. On the other hand, wherever beauty is corrupted, at least two terrible consequences will follow. First of all, as Keats himself quite beautifully, adequately and emphatically states, truth will wither away. <coughs> Pardon me. When he says, beauty is truth and truth beauty, what it means is, that the moment you undermine beauty, truth will wither away. And when truth withers away, it will not create a vacuum, but it will create a universe of falsehood. And uh, I don't have to argue this, that our life is compacted largely of falsehood. The extent to which falsehood reigns supreme is something to which we need to pay attention even as students of literature. After all, all the more so, given the fact that today we very proudly say that we are living in the age of post-truth politics. Post-truth politics. Both religion and politics have abandoned truth. And we have created something else based on untruths and substituted politics and religion with this terrible con these, these terrible concoctions. So the first thing that happens when we corrupt, corrode or compromise the beauty of life is that truth withers away and falsehood begins to rule the roost. And I leave it to investigate the extent to which falsehood has attained ascendancy over our not only public life, but also private life. The second terrible consequence of letting the beauty of life and society wither away is that compassion gives way to cruelty. I can't tell you how ugly cruelty is. You have to walk through, you have to travel through a riot riddled area to realize it. I risked my life in 2002 to travel from uh, Godra to Sabarbadi Ashram. When the Gujarat riots were in progress, 
So I know how ugly riots are. And I, I know how beautiful when one human being shows a little compassion to another. I am reminded of the experience of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was, uh, as you know, a prisoner in Siberia for a while. He was exiled there. And one day he and his fellow prisoners were being taken from one prison to another. It was a cold winter morning. There was a light, slight drizzle, and you can imagine the Siberian winter. And these uh, soldiers were made to <coughs> wait on a railway platform. The train took a while to come and the prisoners were hungry, hungry, famished, cold, shivering. And in the meanwhile, an elderly woman, a beggar woman came that way. She looked at Alexander Solzhenitsyn and realized that this man was extremely hungry. So she put her hand deep into her uh, cloth bag, dirty cloth bag. She pulled out the only loaf of bread she had. <clears throat> she broke that into two. One half she put back in her cloth bag. <clears throat> the other, with all her strength, she threw towards Alexander Solzhenitsyn. She was old, she was feeble, the throw didn't carry. And that broken piece of bread fell into a puddle of water. And recollecting this, Alexander Solzhenitsyn later writes, and I'm going to, I'm quoting from memory, but it will be more or less accurate. He says, the holy bread broken in two lay in the puddle while we were driven away like cattle. You understand? That's, that's where life is. A beggar woman, famished, still <clears throat> harboring the brooding ferocity of hunger in her stomach, can reach her <coughs> scrawny, <coughs> trembling fingers in her cloth bag, break the only little loaf she has and throw it to a famished <coughs> prisoner, even if she doesn't have the strength to throw that broken piece of bread far enough to reach the hunger of the man. That's where life is. That compassion, how can you think of life if that, the wellspring of that compassion dries, as it threatens to do at the moment? We are urged to take pride in cruelty, and compassion is deemed a weakness. I wish I had time to develop this. I'm, I'm, I'm taking view of it for one of time. So, I believe that this is, that is the degradation and the pollution of the beauty of life, the corruption of the beauty of life, with all the consequences thereof. It's a very serious challenge to the students and uh, faculty members of the English department of your college. Now, uh, I, I, I wish to argue that uh, the greatest need today is not a change in government. Others may think that uh, great things can be achieved by changing a government. I don't think so. I think the greatest change that we need is a change in our outlook, <clears throat> a change in our attitude to life, and a change towards insisting on the beauty of life. Our Prime Minister launched the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, the Clean India Movement. I propose another Abhiyan, another movement, Sundar Bharat Abhiyan. <clears throat> I, I pray and I long, I dream of an India that's beautiful, how can a country be clean if it is ugly? I don't understand this. See, oftentimes we have good intentions, but don't, we, do, we do not know where to peg our good intentions. I'm not surprised that the Swachhvara Dabhyan hasn't made much headway because that good intention is not supported by an adequate understanding of life, both individual and collective, and the secrets nuts and bolts of the culture which is sought to be impacted in, this ma in that manner. To me, the greatest citizenship responsibility, the greatest act of patriotism that we can think of at the present time is to try and make Mother India beautiful. I would like to see Mother India beautiful. 
So, to understand this better, <coughs> let me introduce something from spiritual literature, okay? Since I also wear the hat of being a uh, theologian, uh, I do not know how much time I have already consumed. So, Siraj can caution me as soon as I get a signal from you, I will stop as when, wherever we have, we have reached. Pardon? I can go. Okay, okay. Then I will deal with uh, the material. Now, let us take an example from spiritual literature. If you do not mind, I am going to make a reference to the Bible. Not the whole of the Bible, just one particular statement or a symbol that Jesus Christ provided. Jesus imagined human personality in terms of a lamp. Very simple, very domestic, very down to earth. If you and I want to understand ourselves in relation to the theme that we are developing, I will I will drag nothing extraneous into the ambit of our discussion and awareness. If you want to understand yourself right, think of yourself as a lamp. And if you want to understand yourself and the people around you, think of a human being as a lamp. Now Jesus says that this lamp can, can be in two completely different states or if you like you, you can have two different kinds or types of lamps. The first is a lamp with oil inside. The other is a lamp, highly polished perhaps, very ornate, very expensive, very beautiful to look at, but a lamp without oil inside, very easy to fix in your minds. Uh, two lamps, one has oil within, the other has no oil. Let us say, let's say that these, these are identical lamps with the sole difference that one has oil within, the other has no oil within. I would like to suggest that that oil in the lamp of our life is the sense of beauty, beauty. After all, are we not familiar with the aphorism? Beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder, right? What does it mean? It means actually it does not lie in the eye of the beholder. It is a completely wrong statement. Beauty lies in the soul of the beholder. What does it mean? It means that unless and until you have a sense of beauty, unless and until your soul Ha, remains in contact with the beautiful, the beauty of life, you cannot see beauty, any, beauty anywhere. Now, today, you look at the public discourses in progress in our country. Everybody is an expert in finding what is ugly, what is rotten in everybody else. Please do not watch the prime news hour discussions. You will end up completely corrupted. It is a cult in spreading cynicism. The greatest qualification of those who participate in these so-called televised national discussions is the expertise in seeing only what is ugly and what dispirits everyone. This is not life. This is not life as it is. Life is beautiful even today. Look at how parties interact. One party is obliged to say everything ugly about the other party. These days I come under a lot of attack from cyber uh, activists. Whenever I say something good about a particular person, I am pounced upon and mauled for saying something good. I mean, you have to really come into this kind of actual experience to know how terrible the situation is. Nobody likes anything good to be said about anybody. On the other hand, if you say, something absolutely vulgar, disgusting and lumpen about some X, Y or Z, then you have a lot of following. You are considered a, you know, a great man, you know, somebody who is bold, big and bold. Today we need to gain the courage to say that life is beautiful. So, the function of literature and why you and I study literature is that we have a fundamental need, an imperative need to nurture that sense of beauty in our soul and become aware of the beauty of our soul. How many of you realize, I beg of you, 
How many of you realize that you are beautiful? How many of you realize that you have a duty to be beautiful? How many of you realize that you have a right, a fundamental, a birthright to be beautiful? How many of you? And also, you have a duty to make yourself more and more and more beautiful. There's no limit to the beauty that you can attain. Again, a note of warning, I'm not talking about the cosmetic beauty. It's not worth it. It's not worth my time to talk about. I'm talking about the beauty that uh, Keats sort of envision, but something more than that, more than that. Okay. So my concern today, my dear friends, and I'm grateful to Siraj for giving me this opportunity to share my heartache, my pain, unbearable pain, which doesn't allow me to stay quiet in my old age. My pain is that the oil is running out in the lamp of our life. That's my concern. And oftentimes I turn to literature to replenish my lost or my diminishing inward sense of the beauty of life. So the, the oil in the lamp of life is running out both in terms of the individual and in relation to the society. And that is something we need to really take very seriously. Uh, to me, the best part of religion, if at all religion has any justification to exist, I am going to put it in a very, very shocking and radical manner. If at all religion, religion has any excuse for existence, it's only that it can actually awaken this awareness in us and motivate us to become inwardly beautiful. But unfortunately, because the attention and the focus of the people has been shifted from the soul of religion to its bloated body in the form of rituals and customs and practices, all of which are carried out merely mechanically, and therefore it has nothing to do with the sense of the beauty of life that I'm talking about. Religion has become bulk without nourishment. Please remember. Religion has become bulk without nourishment. It's it has lost all its meaning, all its relevance. I'm not saying that religion per se has lost it, but religion as it has come to be practiced and also as it has come to be weaponized, now tends to make life even uglier. Anyway, I, I don't want to go more into that uh, line of thought. Now. Let, let me now bring, so far I was dealing with um, uh, literature at a, at a distance, but let me strike a little balance, belatedly though. Let me connect the sense of beauty and the social change, the change in our consciousness, our change, change in outlook, our change in the perception of ourselves, our idea of personality, our idea of the health and wholeness of the society, so on and so forth, the whole gamut of things. Let me connect it to something right in front of us something that's unfolding right under our nose. And that's the building of the Naya Bharat. I'm sure all of you keep in touch with what is happening in our country. Naya Bharat, Naya Bharat. All right. Now, we have a very energetic Prime Minister to drive this project of Naya Bharat, New India. The old India must go. A new India must come into being birth the new, ring out the old, ring in the new, right? Okay, very good. I am never negative to anything that's new. I welcome the new, but I welcome the new from a perspective. I will not welcome the new simply because something is new. The novelty of something doesn't please me. But if that something has a touch of real freshness about it, then of course I embrace it with all the passion I am capable of. So we have the Prime Minister driving this project. But my concern, my sadness is that we don't have a Rabindranath Tagore to sing about the beauty of the Naya Bharat that we should maintain. And in order to give a taste of what I have in mind, I'm going to read out to you a poem that very likely most of you will know by heart hymn number 35 of Tagore's 
Nobel Prize winning collection of poetry, uh, Gitanjali, right? So I'm going to read out that hymn even if we know it by heart. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by the ever-widening thought and action, into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. Now, that is the vision which alone can preserve the beauty or ensure that the Naya Bharat will be beautiful. If the Naya Bharat is not beautiful, it will not be an improvement on the old. If anything, as the sequence of history tells us, wherever historical, significant historical changes have been brought about with <coughs> without an unwavering eye fixed on the beautiful, the change has proved to be a pyrrhic victory. Or, in simple terms, the change has tend to be a deformation rather than transformation. A change for the worst, not change for the better. Now, how will the English department of this wonderful college understand or interpret this beautiful poem by Gurudev Tagore and spread its message around so that at least the people living in the city of Shimoga will catch the bliss of this vision. You know, a, a country where people can live without f fear, where they can hold their head high, where knowledge is free, where reason prevails, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, so on and so forth. What a beautiful vision it is. But notice that all this big, uh, you know, fanfare about building a new India is not complemented with any idea of what its beneficial and beautiful ingredients should be. And the idea that a Naya Bharat, which is worth it, can be built only with infrastructure, is to me the most pathetic of all ideas. It is a bus ride to nowhere. It's like a stream that's fast running its way into the dreary desert sand that uh, Tagore talks about. So, this prayer by Tagore, to me, ties up very well with our Vedic prayer. Asatoma sadgameya tamasoma jodurgameya mrityorma amrudam gameya. What is the connection between the Naya Bharat and this Vedic prayer, which can be accepted, adopted, used by anybody? I'm a Christian. I've absolutely no problem in repeating this prayer a thousand times because that captures very adequately, beautifully, my own spiritual aspirations. So, uh, it is this kind of social change that we are uniquely equipped to advocate and to give effect to. Now, let me conclude this presentation by reading out a poem by uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Henry Longfellow, the title of the poem is A Psalm of Life. Now, read it slowly so that you can understand. It's a very simple poem. It wouldn't tax your uh, brains. A Psalm of Life. And I would request you to read this poem again and again, just as I would like you to read Tagore's hymn number 35 of Gitanjali. Uh, here is the poem. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. Don't tell me that life is an empty dream. Remember what Macbeth says? Life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. No, that's not what it is. If life, if life were only a tale told by an idiot, Shakespeare would not have written a single play. There would have been no literature. There would have been nothing of value left. 
Life is great, life is beautiful. So that's what Longfellow is saying. Tell me not in mournful numbers. Don't sit and weep, don't blubber. Don't sit and blubber. The life is an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers and things are not what they seem. You get into this kind of uh, wrong impressions because your soul is sleeping. Your soul is dead. You may be alive in your body, but you are dead in your soul. And therefore, you get into this kind of impressions. Life is real. Life is earnest. Life must, must be lived zestfully. Zestfully. You know, uh, uh, Thomas Hardy. I think it's in Tess of Durbervilles, towards the end of that novel. He says, a droll thing life is because the wisdom to live comes pari passu with the departure of the zest for living. That is, by the time you become wise enough to live, you have lost the energy to live, the vitality to live. No, you can acquire the wisdom to live when you still have your full vitality, when you are at the zenith of your vitality. And that's the, that is the, uh, shall I say, the, uh, 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 the invocation and the exhortation that we may derive from sound literature. Life is real, life is earnest, and grave is not its goal. We are not born to die. Between the grave, between the, the cradle and the grave, there is a huge theater of excitement, of wonder, of beauty, of celebration. So, uh, life is real, life is great, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art, dust returnest, was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way, but to act, I'll come to that acting part in a short while, but to act that each tomorrow find us further than today. That is the generation that we must so act today that the generation that comes after us will find the place, a better place, a better world than we found it when we began our journey. Art is long and time is fleeting and our hearts, though stout and brave, still like muffled drums are beating funeral marches to the grave. If we waste our time, life is nothing but a funeral march to the grave. In the world's broad battle, uh, broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb, driven cattle. Don't li live like cattle. Be a hero in the strife. Trust no future, however pleasant. Let the dead past bury its. Don't escape to the future. Don't live in the past. Act, act in the living present. Heart within and God overhead. I have to pause here for a short while and give you an idea about what the poet means by word act. By the way, as students of literature who are studying an alien literature for all practical purposes, we must understand that understand until we develop sufficient semantic sensitivity and enter into the nuances of the words, the meaning nuances of the words that we handle, we will uh, stay at a maximum distance from the heart of literature. For example, take a word like act. There are th let me use three words, labor, work, act. You engage a daily uh, laborer who comes and works in your field, daily uh, wage earner. Then you engage a carpenter, the carpenter works. Uh, you work. As a teacher, I worked. Um, a bus driver works, a, 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 a section officer in the office works, so a doctor works, an engineer works. But act, the word act denotes something else. To act is to engage in significant deeds. That alone is action. To act is to live significantly. If you exist from day to day, if you drift from day to day, you don't act. You either labor or you maximum you work. I would urge my colleagues in the English department of the college, your, your college, not only to teach, but also to teach teaching as an action, not merely as labor, not merely as work. When you teach as action, 
you will never talk about the workload. It becomes a celebration and an excitement. Okay, so trust no future, however pleasant. Let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present, heart within and God overhead. Now comes the last stanza, which I commend to you and it's worthwhile uh, learning. It's not the last stanza, but the last stanza I read that I'll stop. Or maybe I'll, I'll continue that. Life so great, men, you, you, it's worthwhile to learn the stanza by heart. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Beautiful. I'll repeat that and then I close. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Well, uh, I think I'll close here. And perhaps I'll raise two questions that you can continue to discuss among yourself. And I'm ra raising these two questions in relation to the poem that I just read out, that is uh, Longfellow's poem. What personal change can this poem bring about, as far as you are concerned? Secondly, to what extent can that personal change lead to some kind of social change? Because, as Gandhi insisted, changes happen only when we dare to be the change that we want to see around us. He said, become the change that you want to see around you. And being students of literature, readers of literature, I've suggested a particular perspective. And that perspective is the perspective of the beauty of life. And anyone, I believe, anyone who is inspired, truly inspired, by a sound sense of the beauty of life, not the beauty of the body, the beauty of life, will not waste his or her life in idleness, in drifting from the, uh, the cradle to the grave and disappearing like a bubble. But as Kierke, Soren Kierkegaard, that great Danish philosopher said, he said, most people are like the leaf on a tree that just sits there. Time has it, takes its toll on it, and it withers, it falls down, and it is blown away by the wind to the heart of the forest, never to be seen again. A life that is wasted, a life of no impact, a life that never knew any touch of vitality. That's not our calling. Believe in yourself, believe in the beauty of life, believe in the ultimate justice of life and believe, as the poet says, that there is a force above you which anyone, anyone, including, including Hegel, anyone with a sense of history will tell you that it is so. Our earthly existence can never be summarized in terms of the materialistic and mechanical processes that we are familiar with. It's always acted upon by something beyond. If you read Immanuel Kant's sense, uh, insights into universal history, he, he also emphasizes this idea. He says, people act on the horizontal plane, but far above them and unknown to them, there is a realm of force. And in the final analysis, history will prove that people who strutted and fretted their art upon the stage, as Shakespeare's Richard II says, they were merely acting according to the wires, the strings pulled from that higher source. And, uh, uh, and therefore, take heart. Nothing can be ultimately lost. There is an irreducible core of goodness about life because no human being, however powerful, is given the right to come anywhere near it, leave alone, make a dent on it. Life will remain in spite of the tyrants and dictators of the world. But it requires ordinary, humble, seemingly insignificant